Hey there, this is Ike Hoffman with Tactica Real Estate Solutions, and we're going to fully underwrite an 88 unit apartment building development. This is the second video of a two part video series. Part two, the video you're watching, is going to cover how to do a thorough, extensive analysis using Tactica's multifamily development model. If you missed part one, it's linked below. And that was showing you how you could use Tactica's back of the envelope template to quickly do a feasibility study, determine if the project is worth sinking more time into. At the end of video one, we decided that yes, it was. The project, we're lukewarm on it, but we think there's some toggles we can play with to make it feasible. If you've been enjoying Tactica underwriting tutorials, I'd really appreciate if you'd like the video, subscribe to our channel and allow us to notify you when we're releasing new video content. Let's begin our underwriting exercise. If you watched video one, we didn't have a ton of information yet about our potential project. We had a few rough estimates for certain inputs, but now we have vetted data. We've talked to property managers in town, architects, general contractors, and lenders, and we have a much better feel for the inputs that are gonna be going into the model. We studied the submarket more thoroughly, we did a rent comp survey, and we flushed out the unit mix. This is the information we have that we'll eventually input into Tactica's development model. On the left side, we have stabilized operations. So starting with the unit mix, in the first video, we estimated that we have 88 units and that the rent would be $1,800. Now that we flushed out the unit mix, we're gonna see a little bit more revenue hitting the pro forma. Our chunk rent is $815. The average square footage is a little bit larger than we projected. However, the rent per square foot has fallen slightly from our original projections to $2.18 down from $2.25. You may also recall that we initially projected $250,000 in other income potential in our initial run. Unfortunately, that number has come down a bit. When we tally up parking income, storage income, and other miscellaneous fees, we're only getting to $237,000. So we lost a bit of income there. The good news is, is on the expense side, after talking to a qualified property manager that has experience managing this asset class, our total expenses came down from an estimated $911,000 all the way down to $822,000, which is closer to a 40% expense ratio when we had been originally projecting a 45% expense ratio. We talked to a lender, we got some baseline financing terms, we think we could do a 65% loan to cost loan, um, the interest rate on that would be 6% full term interest only. We estimate that it would be outstanding for 14 months. And then finally, we buttoned up our construction budget. We talked to architects, engineers, our general contractor, and we got pretty solid bids on what a lot of the main construction cost items would be if we were to commence the project. So we start with the square footage summary on the top. We have our land cost at 2.8 million. The hard costs on a per square foot basis, 175 plus a 10% contingency, which equates to a $17.50 contingency. We can actually sum that below. Make that black text, add a few decimal places. And then our soft costs are summarized below that, equate for 13% of the total construction cost. So total, we're, we're coming in at $22 million in total construction costs, which is actually very close to what we had initially projected in our back of the napkin multifamily development template. And then as a refresher, we also have some sales comps. Wanna point out that these eight comps are newly constructed class A properties in the same submarket, but about a year ago, or well, I should say from six months ago to a year ago, the cap rates were noticeably lower can see they average out about 4.64% if we look at property six, seven, and eight. In the recent sales, in the rising interest rate environment and, and just some more uncertainty in the overall multifamily space, we're averaging exactly 5%. We'll be using this data when we come up with our residual sale assumption here shortly. We're gonna err on the side of caution and, and lean, lean more heavily on the, the, the sales that have sold more recently at the higher cap rates. As we begin populating the model, I'm gonna be moving fast. You may have some questions about why I'm doing certain things for certain assumptions, and just know that this isn't a how to use tutorial. I mean, there's, there's gonna be some overlap, obviously. I'm gonna to need to explain some things, but if you want some more background into how the development model actually works, I have a link below, 
And it's going to take you to the tutorial blog post that literally covers every single tab, every assumption, and gives just a ton of in-depth information that I've, I've been adding to over the years. There's unlimited resources on Tactica's website that show you how to use this model correctly. Let's get started. All right, so the name, let's just call this Deeper Analysis. That's what the project is called. It's, we'll say it's on 0.7 acres. Uh, the project square footage, it was 86082. There were 90 parking spaces. And it's gonna be one building, four stories, and we won't worry about an address. Those assumptions won't impact anything in the model. For our construction financing assumptions, uh, 14 months is actually correct. That's, that's how long we're assuming the construction period will take. We're gonna get a 65% construction loan with a 6% interest rate. And let's make some pre-leasing assumptions. I'm gonna assume that once construction's complete and residents are able to move in, we're gonna be 30% pre-lease. So that's about 26 out of the 88 units will be leased before we even open the doors. And then from there, we'll lease about nine a month. Our stabilized occupancy will we'll specify as 95%. This is what would trigger the refinance. And we think our rents are accurately priced. We've done research, we're conservative. So we're not gonna plan on giving away any concessions during the lease up. And once we fill out the model a little further, there'll be a nice summary here of, of when the property gets the certificate of occupancy, when the property stabilizes, so it gets above 95% occupancy, and what month the refi will take place. So now we need to put in some permanent financing assumptions. As you recall, we were looking at sales comps just a couple minutes ago, and we saw that newer construction class A has been selling closer to a five cap. Well, we're not planning to recap really until about two years after the start date of the project. So we wanna be conservative and let's actually increase that a little, the cap rate at refi to 5.2. So 20 extra basis points of cushion. Uh, loan to value, we're gonna do another 65% permanent financing. And we, we've talked to lenders and, and in today's environment, they think that with such low leverage, a 5.5% interest rate is reasonable. 30 year amortization with no interest only and the loan cost would be about 1% of the loan amount. And then the stabilized cap rate today, again, we're gonna reference those sales comps. While things you know, six, nine, 12 months ago, were trading closer to a four and three quarter cap, things recently have been a five cap. This assumption here is gonna determine our residual assumption. So how much are we gonna increase the residual cap rate by each year? I like to do 10 basis points and in, in specifically in the Twin Cities where I'm located. So as an example, if, if the cap rate's 5% today, and we sell the deal in 10 years, it's gonna increase 10 basis points every year. So our residual sale assumption would be six. And then the cost of sale, this is your, your brokerage fees, your deed tax, legal, um, all those closing costs that take place in a real estate transaction, we will plug in 1% for now. I'm gonna scroll over to the right and also enter in some fees that, that we will be charging. We're gonna have a 2% development fee, which is a percentage of total construction costs, and then we're also gonna charge an in-house construction management fee, which is a percentage of hard costs of 2.5%. We're gonna revisit this tab. There's still a lot of errors and, and nothing's really calculating because we still have a ton of different assumptions to fill in. So let's move on to the budget and draw tab. Let's start at the top and begin inputting our vetted construction cost assumptions that we reviewed not too long ago. All right, so we've inputted all of our projected construction costs and we can see the total down here equates to 22.16 million in total construction costs. And now let's go to the unit mix. So we have a flushed out unit mix and we're going to just copy and paste that directly from our other document that we've been referencing. And then I'm going to grab the rents separately, paste his values, and I'm going to hide the excess rows. 
and we don't have any inclusionary zoning or, or any mandatory rental discounts we need to factor. So I'm gonna hide these columns as well and just clean up this tab a little bit. So now our unit mix is finalized. 88 units, average square footage of 831, average trunk rent of 1815, and then the rent per square foot of $2.18. And then the last significant assumptions we need to make are on the stabilized and operations tab. So this is the information we got from our potential property manager that gave us realistic inputs for operating revenues and expenses that we'd expect to see once this property stabilized. So we're running vacancy at 6%. I'll also note that the rental data is, is flowing in directly from the unit mix tab. So we don't need to do anything there. We're gonna run a 6% vacancy to be conservative. Um, for storage, we determined that there were, there were 50 potential storage rentals. We're gonna run a 6% vacancy there and 90 parking spaces. We'll also run a 6% vacancy here and the market rate for these parking, these covered parking spaces are $125. And then finally, other income, this could be pet fees, pet rent, short-term leasing fees, break lease fees, damages. We think that we think we're gonna have an additional $75,000 coming in every year from all those miscellaneous items. So in this other row, I'm going to plug in 88 units and we, we need to back in to what that monthly revenue would look like. So I'm going to do 75,000 divided by 12 divided by 88 units, which equals $71 per unit in monthly revenue. And then if we look at the annualized column in column H, it equals 75,000. And then we'll also run a 6% vacancy to err on the side of conservative, and then it will drop down to 70,500. And then we need to input expenses. Let's refer to our vetted deal information for these inputs as well. We looked at property taxes for comparable properties and we determined that property taxes per unit, once this property were stabilized, would be around $3,900 per unit. We know that the applicable tax rate in the jurisdiction is 1.55%, and then we can just play with this reassessment as a percentage of project cost to back in to the correct stabilized per unit. And coincidentally, that is right around 100%. So if we plug in 100%, you can see that the projected stabilized real estate tax is payable equals 3903. That's close enough. But then we need to determine when these property taxes will stabilize. Remember, this property is being developed and you may not see the full burden of these property taxes until year three or potentially even year four. So I'm gonna say that in year two, that's when we would finish construction and begin leasing. The assessor's probably gonna see us as being about 50% stabilized. And then in year two, we would be fully stabilized. And from there, property taxes would increase 3% a year thereafter through the end of the pro forma. So if we widen this column a bit, you can see in, in, in year two, we're gonna see 171,000 in property tax liability, and then it's gonna jump up to that stabilized amount in year three, and then 3% increases thereafter. The last thing we need to do on the stabilized operations tab is make operating assumptions for all of our revenue and expense line items post stabilization. So I'm gonna assume that Rents will increase 3% per year. I'm not gonna have a loss to lease or concessions assumption. We're gonna leave those at 0%. And we're gonna run vacancy at 5%. And we'll run bad debt at 0.5%, or half a percentage point. And then we're gonna increase other revenue and expenses at 3%. And then I will drag all of these assumptions over through year 11 of the pro forma. So now let's take a walk back through the tabs and just make sure everything is populated and working properly. The Unimix tab, there's nothing to do here. If you did want to make an assumption of rent growth during the construction period, you could do so here. However, I think it's really risky to do that. This has a big impact on returns. So if you, if you grew rents at two or 3%, 
during the 14 months that this property is under construction, it's, it's gonna really boost your equity multiples and IRRs. I wanna keep it conservative, so I'm leaving that at 0%. All right, in the budget and draw tab, I'm seeing that we have an operating shortfall of $75,000. So what's happening here is once this development gets this CO, early on in the lease up, there's not enough revenue to support the debt service. So essentially we'd fully we, we would fully draw on the construction loan, but the income coming in from rent wouldn't be sufficient enough to pay the construction loan interest. So what I like to do is when I see an operating shortfall here, I like to add an operating capital reserve. So I already have a, a row dedicated to that here. And our operating shortfall is 75 grand and I wanna be conservative, so I'm gonna add 110,000 in operating capital and you can see it, it goes away. So what's happening? Well, we have a custom election here under method and then I'm gonna scroll all the way over and I'm not actually allocating this 110,000 anywhere in the construction period. You can see like in marketing, the row before, we have a $90,000 budget. I'm doing $30,000 in month 13, 30,000 in month 14, and I'm leaving $30,000 for the final marketing push once the property has its certificate of occupancy. But this 110,000 is never utilized. So th these are funds that we can now draw on during the lease up if we're in a situation where revenue isn't sufficient enough to cover that con construction debt early in the lease up time frame. And now when we go to the project summary tab, everything is calculating and populated. All of our graphs look good. I don't see any error messages. We're pretty much done inputting information. The next tab I wanna look at is the return summary tab. So this is really the first tab I'm gonna look at to determine if investment opportunity has legs. These returns are far too skinny for a new development. Five year IRR, is only 8.9%, the equity multiple 1.5. These are these are project level returns. You can buy an existing project and, and hit these types of returns. Some other things I don't like just looking at this, the permanent financing just barely takes out the construction loan. So we're saying this property would stabilize at the end of year two. There's only 15 million in, in permanent financing proceeds and it's only a couple hundred thousand more than the construction loan pay down. So if really anything goes wrong or interest rates continue to rise or there's just not as much rental demand, you might be stuck in the construction loan and that's, that's no position a developer wants to be in. Now, the other thing that I don't love, we talked about the IRRs being too low um, already, if we come to the permanent financing section on the project summary tab, that stabilized DSCR we have is only isn't, isn't even 1.2. A lot of lenders will, will check off on 1.15. I've even seen some go as low as 1.1. But ideally, you would want to see this higher on this initial underwriting run to give yourself some cushion. Because the last thing you want is to be stuck in that construction financing, especially if it's floating rate. And then let's look at the return on cost. As a refresher, the return on cost is the stabilized NOI divided by the total construction cost. You want that to be significantly higher than the market cap rate. The higher it is than the market cap rate, the more potential profit you'll see as the developer. If the market cap rate's 5%, remember looking at those sale comps, that's, that's where we're estimating the if we were able to sell this asset as stabilized today, we'd expect it to sell around a five cap. Well, we can go on our stress tests. I, I leave these off in their default state because they suck up a ton of computing power, but let's turn on the projected return on cost. You can see it's 5.38%. So we would build this for a 5.38% yield and we could sell it back to the market at a 5% yield. Just in deals that I see, that's probably not sufficient. Maybe in some coastal markets, that would be enough. Uh, and they would be confident moving forward. But in the Midwest, where I'm prim primarily looking at deals, you really need to see at least 75 basis points, if not 100 or a one point spread between the return on cost and the market cap rate. So this just really isn't cutting it right now. And finally, if, if you were doing something like an IR waterfall, if we come in here, let's just, let's just use the IR waterfall as an example and you were putting in say 10% as the sponsor. So you're sponsoring this development, you're gonna raise LP money, you put in 10%, you raise the other 90% and you have a nine 
9% and 16% threshold waterfall, this project won't even get into the second hurdle rate. You can tell because the project cash flows, 8.866% IRR, and the GPLP cash flows are the same as that because both the GP and the LP will get a commensurate distribution with what they contributed to the deal. So if you are showing this potential project to, to investors, they're, they're probably not going to be too excited about. If you watched video one, one of the areas I thought we may have some leverage is with the land cost. I mean, let's pretend this land has been for sale for a while and that 2.8 asking price has some flexibility. If we are able to get the land for say 1.8 million instead of 2.8 million, that had a material impact on the project level IRRs and equity multiple. That may be where you start negotiating to hopefully see better return. Even if we received a million dollar discount on the land, these returns still aren't phenomenal. Again, this is development, it's risky. And these are the types of yields that are being projected on existing deals, value add deals that don't have nearly as much risk as a ground up development. What we also talked about in video one, there might be the potential to add more units. So we're solving for 88 units, but what if your architect figures out that, hey, you can actually fit two more one bedrooms and get up to 90 units. So if we come to the unit mix and plug in 32 units instead of 30 and come back to our return summary, we're starting to make a little more progress. That didn't have as much impact as the million dollar discount on the land, but there was a, a noticeable increase in project level IRRs and equity multiples if we were able to add two more units. You can also see that the refinance proceeds are more abundant now. Now there's a nice cushion between the permanent financing and the construction loan, nearly 1.6 million when it was just a couple hundred thousand dollars in our original scenario. Me personally, if just looking at these numbers, even adding the two units and cutting land costs, this would be a no. Just speaking from having seen a lot of different development deals flow through Tacticus Pro Forma models, this is um, a lot skinnier than, than I'd be accustomed to, unless it's institutional in the coastal markets. I've seen skinnier yields and, and that's more customary out there, but, but for most private investors, there's most likely not enough meat on the bone uh, for this de development to be feasible. In summary, we fully underwrote an 88 unit multifamily development. In video one, we started with the initial feasibility study. At that juncture, we didn't know what we had. We had some very high level assumptions and we just wanted to determine if it would be worth sinking more time into. The investment prognosis at that point in time was lukewarm at best. However, I thought there were some toggles we could play with and ultimately decided to move to Tactica's multifamily development model to do that extensive underwriting run. Once we got all the vetted data inputted into Tactica's development model, it still wasn't looking great. We cut the land cost by a million dollars. We added two units, but ultimately, I didn't think the returns were suitable for a new development project. I hope this exercise was beneficial. If you're finding value in Tactica's underwriting tutorials, please give the video a like, subscribe to Tactica's channel, and let us notify you in releasing new video content. I really appreciate you taking along, and we'll talk to you next time. Take care.